the arrogant Galactic Council sneered as Earth's ambassador stormed out, but they didn't know humankind was already preparing a fierce counter-strike to their ultimate humiliation. Supreme Councillor Zarkon lounged in his opulent private quarters, celebrating humanity's subjugation with his inner circle. The fool ambassador Adams had dared to reject generous terms to exist as second-class citizens in the glorious Draconis Empire. Now Earth must submit in ten solar days or burn. The humans' primitive ships are no match for our armada, Zarkon boasted. I will relish watching their fleet melt to molten slag. Spymaster Xyloth frowned. My liege, our analysts warn the humans grow desperate. They may attempt an ill-conceived attack. Let them come, Zarkon roared. The Council's technology so eclipses Earth's that challenging us would spell their doom. Today dawns the Draconis Golden Age of Galactic Rule. In the Council's hangar bay, Ambassador Adams stormed up his shuttle's ramp, marine bodyguards flanking him. He glared at the Draconis honor guards. Golden Age, Adams muttered. We'll see about that, you scaly bastards. Fleet Admiral Shu won't let this stand. Adams knew that if Shu's daring plan failed, humanity was finished. But if it succeeded, the Council would rue this day for generations. The Draconis had no idea what horrors humans were truly capable of in war. Admiral Cole Blackwell stood on the bridge of the Moscow, his eyes fixed on the holomap displaying Earth's defences. His senior staff surrounded him, their faces tense as they prepared for the imminent Draconis invasion. The bridge hummed with activity, officers manning their stations and relaying updates. Admiral, a shuttle is requesting permission to dock, the Comem's officer reported. It's Ambassador Adams returning from the council station. Blackwell nodded. Grant permission and have him escorted to the conference room immediately. Minutes later, Adams strode into the room, his expression grim. He recounted Councillor Zarkon's ultimatum and the Draconis' arrogance, their unwavering belief that Earth would fall easily. Blackwell slammed his fist on the table, his eyes blazing with determination. Those scaly bastards think they can just waltz in and take our planet. They've got another thing coming. We'll show them the grave error of underestimating human resolve and tenacity. He turned to his staff. Order the fleet to the dark side of Luna. It's time to reveal our ace in the hole. In the briefing room, Blackwell brought up a schematic of a massive structure hidden within the moon. Gentlemen, meet Goliath, our top-secret superweapon. It's a gigantic mass driver, capable of accelerating 100-ton tungsten rods to a sizable fraction of light speed. Murmurs of disbelief and awe filled the room. Speculation about a secret lunar military base had circulated for decades, but no one had suspected anything of this scale. Blackwell continued, At near light speed, the rod's kinetic energy upon impact will rival a nuclear bomb. We'll use Goliath to take out the Draconis capital ships while our fleet deals with their screens and escorts. He paused, his expression grave. But there's a catch. Powering Goliath requires redirecting nearly the entire output of the lunar He-3 reactors. We'll only get one shot at a first strike before the Draconis hit our satellite network and expose the moon base's location. The room fell silent, the weight of the situation sinking in. Everything rode on this single roll of the dice. Blackwell looked around at his staff, his voice firm. This is our chance to strike a decisive blow against the Draconis. We'll show them what happens when they mess with Earth. Failure is not an option. As the staff dispersed to prepare for the operation, Blackwell turned to the hollow map, his jaw set with determination. The fate of humanity rested on their shoulders, and he would stop at nothing to ensure their survival. Major Javier Jav Rodriguez sat at his station in the CIC of Goliath base, eyes glued to the readouts monitoring the mass driver's relativistic launch accelerators spinning up. The Draconis Armada was less than two hours from Earth orbit. Tension filled the air as the final countdown began. Status report, all sections! General Jasmine Chandra barked, her gaze fixed on the countdown timer. She paced the CIC, hands clasped behind her back. Reactors at maximum output, General, an officer called out. Capacitors charging, launch rails energizing. 
Tungsten rods loaded and ready in the launch bay, another reported. Chandra nodded curtly. At T5 minutes, a deep rumble started, growing into a teeth-rattling vibration felt through the entire seven-kilometer length of the moon base. Down in the launch bay, Technical Sergeant Amir Hassan waited anxiously at his control console, wiping sweat from his brow with a shaking hand. He was one of the few who knew the true nature of this jury-rigged superweapon, untested at full power until now. The weight of what they were about to attempt hit him like a punch to the gut. Allahu Akbar, he muttered under his breath, reciting a prayer in Arabic as he watched the countdown tick down. A T2 minutes, the fire order from CIC appeared on his console. With a deep breath, he began the final arming sequence, his fingers flying over the controls. Above the lunar surface, the human fleet waited with bated breath in close formation behind Luna's horizon, hidden from the enemy sensors. On the bridge of the flagship, Ambassador Adams and Admiral Blackwell stood before the tactical hollow display, watching the Draconi's fleet approach. Their faces were grim, jaws clenched tight. The seconds ticked down. Three, two, one. Abruptly, the moon's dark side lit up like a dozen suns as Goliath fired. The muzzle flash visible even in the vacuum of space. A volley of tungsten telephone poles, each massing 100 tons, hurtled towards the enemy fleet at 20% of light speed. There was no sound in the void, but every human felt a primal roar reverberate in their souls as they surged around Luna's edge, straining to see the Draconi's reaction. The enemy fleet was plunged into chaos, the blinding flash throwing their formation into disarray. Mere seconds later, the first relativistic rounds found their marks, striking with the force of nuclear bombs. Ships crumpled and exploded as the ultra-dense kinetic kill projectiles tore through them like tissue paper, the sheer energy of their impacts vaporizing hulls and crews alike. The Draconis never even saw what hit them. Zarkon lounged on his command throne, a smug grin plastered across his scaly visage as he watched the blue-green arc of Earth grow larger on the viewscreen. The primitive humans would soon learn their place, groveling at the feet of the mighty Draconis Empire. His clawed fingers drummed on the armrest, eager for the impending conquest. Without warning, the viewscreen flared a blinding white searing Zarkon's retinas. The deck bucked violently beneath his feet, hurling him from his throne in an undignified sprawl. He crashed to the floor, his crown clattering away as emergency klaxons blared. Report! Zarkon roared, struggling to his feet. His head throbbed, vision still spotty from the flash. The ship's AI droned over the chaos. Escorts Krutan and Nakatoth vaporized by unknown weapon. Capital ships Maktar, Zinkaru and Vorlak suffering catastrophic damage. Vorlak silent, all hands lost. Zarkon staggered to the tactical console, shoving aside the dazed operator. The readouts flickered and danced, sensors overloaded by the blast. He pounded the console, bellowing for answers, but his bridge crew scrambled in panic, their usually precise discipline shattered. Incoming, the weapons officer shouted, her voice cracking. Four projectiles, fraction of light speed, impact imminent. Zarkon whirled to the screen, eyes widening as the computer tracked four shimmering lines arcing past the flagship at impossible speeds. No point defense could touch them. They flashed towards the battleships Kanvir, Zalnath, Din Roth and Korvax, striking them amidships with unimaginable force. The mighty warships crumpled like cheap plastic toys hit by a sledgehammer, their hulls shattering. Blinding fireballs consumed them as their antimatter reactors lost containment, the detonations rippling across the fleet. In an instant, a third of his most powerful ships were gone. Zarkon gaped at the carnage, his mind reeling. How could the primitives wield such devastating power? It defied belief. A new context, the sensor officer cried, pointing to the screen. Human fleet closing fast. From behind Earth's moon, the human ships surged into view, engines burning at full power as they knifed towards the Draconi's broken formation. Zarkon cursed, realizing they had blundered into a trap. The humans had played the helpless fools, luring them in only to sucker-punch them with this new weapon. Return fire, 
Zarkon screamed at the weapons officer Spittle flying, burn them from the sky. But it was too late. The human barrage of missiles, railguns, and particle beams slammed into the Draconis ships, their shields wavering under the onslaught. The flagship shuddered, sparks flying from overloaded consoles. Acrid smoke choked the air as the lights flickered. In the chaos, a tense voice cut through the din. Sire, we must withdraw. Zarkon turned to see Spymaster Xyloth, his usually immaculate robe singed and torn. The Spymaster met his gaze, face grim yet resolute, as he uttered the phrase not heard in generations. Sir Zarkon's fists clenched fury and disbelief warring within him. Retreat! Impossible! Yet as he looked at the viewscreen, his fleet burning and the human ships closing in for the kill, a cold dread settled in his gut. The Moscow shook as a plasma torpedo impacted its shields. Sparks flew from overloaded consoles on the bridge. Damage control crews raced to contain fires breaking out across multiple decks. Admiral Blackwell gripped his chair's armrests, knuckles white as he weathered the hit. His eyes darted across the tactical display, taking in the fleet status with a sinking feeling in his gut. Admiral, the cruisers Toronto and Jakarta report main power offline, the ops officer called out, her voice strained. The carrier Sao Paulo is venting atmosphere, hull breaches on multiple decks. The destroyer Kyoto, she's gone, sir, all hands lost. Blackwell closed his eyes for a moment, his jaw clenched tight. The losses were heavy, but they paled in comparison to the Draconis's casualties. The hollow display showed the enemy fleet in disarray, their formation shattered. Most of their capital ships were nothing more than expanding clouds of molten debris, ripped apart by Goliath's relativistic bombardment and the human fleet's unrelenting assault. Ambassador Adams staggered to Blackwell's side, wiping blood from a gash on his forehead. Despite the carnage, he grinned fiercely. I think we have their attention now, Admiral. Blackwell nodded, his expression grim. That we do, Ambassador, but we can't let up. Not until they're running with their tails between their legs. He turned to the weapons officer. Concentrate fire on their flagship. Have the London and Berlin focus everything they've got on that bastard Zarkon's ship. On the bridge of the Draconis flagship, Zarkon picked himself up off the deck, his ornate robes torn and singed. Fury burned in his eyes as he surveyed the destruction wrought upon his fleet. Spymaster Xyloth limped to his side, one arm hanging useless at his side. Sire, we must withdraw, Xyloth urged, his voice ragged with pain, regroup and... Withdraw? Zarkon snarled, rounding on the Spymaster. The Draconis do not flee from primitives. We will crush these upstart humans and... Sire, the humans have destroyed sixty percent of our forces in minutes, Xyloth snapped, cutting off Zarkon's tirade. If we do not pull back now, we will have no fleet left at all. Zarkon opened his mouth to retort, but the ship's AI blared a proximity alert. Warning, two human boarding shuttles have penetrated our shields. They have latched onto the hull near the hangar bays. The counselor froze, the realization that the battle was truly lost sinking in like a lead weight in his stomach. His fists clenched and unclenched as he struggled with the bitter taste of defeat. Order, order a fighting withdrawal, Zarkon ground out, each word feeling like broken glass in his throat. All ships fall back and regroup at the edge of the system. As the Draconis fleet began a humiliating retreat, Zarkon turned to the ship's marine commander. Deal with the borders. Let none survive. He drew his sidearm, the weapon feeling heavy in his hand. I will handle this personally. The flagship's hangar bay was a scene of tense preparation, Crates and shuttles were hastily shoved into makeshift barricades as the squad of Draconis marines took up defensive positions. Sergeant Kaz Roth stalked the line, his voice a harsh bark over the clamour of equipment and muttered curses. Eyes sharp, weapons ready, no human filth sets foot on this ship. The marines clutched their rifles tight, talons flexing on the triggers. A distant boom echoed through the hull, followed by another, louder. The boarding shuttles had latched on. Kazroth hissed through bared teeth. The humans were cutting through. Abruptly, the outer doors buckled inward, with a tortured shriek of rending metal. 
Smoke billowed through the widening gap, acrid and choking. The Marines squinted into the roiling black cloud, their gun barrels twitching at every swirl and eddy. Kazroth's eyes caught a flash of movement. Something arced out of the smoke, small and round, clattering across the deck. His pupils narrowed to slits. Grenade! The flashbang went off like a thunderclap, searing white light stabbing into the Marines' eyes. They reeled back, shaking their heads, blinking away spots. Disoriented, their tight formation loosened. It was the only opening the humans needed. From the thinning smoke, a hail of hypersonic flechettes scythed through the Draconis' ranks. The razor-sharp darts shredded scales and flesh, punching through armor like paper. Marines crumpled and fell, twitching, blood pooling around them. Ears ringing, Kazroth dragged himself up on one knee. He shook his head, trying to clear it, his grip tightening on his rifle. A hulking figure materialized out of the haze, mere feet away. Matter black armor, Marsok, emblazoned on the chestplate. Kazroth raised his rifle with a snarl, but the commando was faster. An armored hand batted the gun aside almost casually. The other hand flashed out, a blade glinting in the smoke-diffused light. The knife sank into Kazroth's throat, parting scales and flesh like water. He felt the icy burn of neurotoxin, the strength flooding out of his body. Darkness crept in at the edges of his vision. The last thing Sergeant Kazroth saw as he slid to the floor was his own reflection in the commando's mirrored visor. Two words stenciled beneath, his own dying eyes staring back at him. Reaper 6 The emergency light strobed through the smoke-filled corridors of the Draconis flagship, casting eerie shadows that danced to the wailing klaxons. The sharp staccato of suppressed weapons fire punctuated the chaos as Reaper Six and his strike team moved swiftly through the ship, dispatching any resistance with ruthless efficiency. Lieutenant James Jimmy Wu took point, his matte black powered armor absorbing the hellish red light. His suit's AI scanned the gloom, highlighting threats and feeding tactical data directly to his HUD. Motion trackers, showed multiple hostiles converging on their position from adjoining passages. We got lizards in the vents, Jimmy said over the encrypted comm, his voice flat and calm amid the din. Mac, find us a route to the target. Staff Sergeant Antonio Mac McKenzie, Jimmy's second in command, consulted the hollow schematic of the ship hovering over his gauntlet. The neon blue wireframe rotated as he swiped, zooming in on their objective. Computer core is two decks down, boss. Mac replied, his gravelly baritone cutting through the static, straight shot down the main access way, then hang a right at the reactor bulkhead. Jimmy nodded, signaling the team forward. They stacked up at the junction, weapons trained down the smoke-choked hall. Mac's armored bulk pressed against the bulkhead as he peered around the corner, his rifle's muzzle-mounted light probing the haze. Clear, he grunted, moving up. The squad fell in behind him, bounding from cover to cover, leapfrogging each other with practiced precision. They reached the reactor bulkhead unchallenged, the thick armored door looming before them. Mac placed a gloved hand against the reinforced metal, his suit's sensors probing for weaknesses. He chuckled, a dark rumble in his chest. Time to introduce these scaly bastards to the 21st century concept of cyber warfare, he said, pulling a data spike from his belt. He jammed the device into a maintenance port, the spike's monomolecular edge slicing through the tamper-resistant housing like a hot knife through butter. Reaper Six took up overwatch as Mac worked, his rifle trained on the smoke-shrouded corridor behind them. Jimmy's HUD lit up with a flood of data as the spike wormed its way into the ship's network, his suit's AI sifting through the information at lightning speed. Draconis fleet deployments, communication protocols, encryption keys... It was all there, laid bare by the spike's intrusion. The data streamed across Jimmy's visor in a cascade of neon hieroglyphs, each one a piece of the puzzle that could turn the tide of the war. To downloading now, Mac reported, his voice tense with concentration. Damn, their ice is tough, gonna take a minute to crack. Jimmy nodded, his eyes never leaving the corridor. The motion tracker showed movement in the vents above them, closing fast. He raised his rifle, 
targeting reticle settling on the nearest grate. Suddenly the vent cover burst open, and a figure dropped to the deck behind them with feline grace. It rose to its full height, towering over the humans, its ornate armor glinting in the strobing light. Councillor Zarkon leveled his sidearm at Jimmy's back, his voice a sibilant hiss over the klaxons. Die, primate filth! Without hesitation, Jimmy whirled, his armor's servos whining with the speed of the movement. His rifle barked three times, the hypersonic rounds slamming into Zarkon's personal shield. The first two rounds overloaded the barrier in a shower of sparks, and the third punched clean through Zarkon's breastplate, blowing a fist-sized hole in his chest. The counselor crumpled to the deck, his eyes wide with shocked disbelief. He twitched once, twice, then lay still, a pool of viscous blue blood spreading beneath him. Mac glanced back at the fallen Zarkon, his lips twisting in a wolfish grin beneath his visor. One roasted lizard coming right up! He turned back to the data spike, its holographic display flashing with a cascade of alien code. Virus uploaded. Their systems are fucked six ways from Sunday. Shields, weapons, propulsion all offline. This bird is dead in space. The breaching charge detonated with a concussive thump, the armoured housing of the computer core disintegrating in a hail of white-hot shrapnel. Mac stepped back admiring his handiwork with a satisfied nod as the once imposing banks of alien hardware collapsed into smouldering rubble. In that instant, the flagship's main lights flickered and died, plunging the corridors into a cloak of inky darkness. Jimmy's helmet automatically switched to low-light mode, casting the scene in an otherworldly green hue. Crimson emergency lighting sputtered to life a heartbeat later, pulsing in time with the klaxon's mournful wail. On the bridge, a wave of dread rippled through the crew as one by one, the ship's primary systems winked out on the hollow displays. Spymaster Xyloth's talons dug into the command chair's armrests, his midnight scales standing out in sharp contrast against his knuckles, pale from the strain. The weapons officer, his voice tight, reported the grim news. Spymaster, main drives and shields are offline. We're dead in the void. At the comm station, the communications officer worked his console with increasing desperation, the clicks of his claws on the haptic interface betraying his fraying nerves. He looked up, golden eyes wide. I can't raise Counselor Zarkon. He's... he's not responding. Xyloth's eyes narrowed to glittering slits, his razor-sharp mind already racing through the implications. The ship was crippled, and their supreme leader was missing likely dead at the hands of the human strike team. A lesser being might have succumbed to panic, but Xyloth had not clawed his way to the upper echelons of the Draconis by hesitating in the face of adversity. He rose to his full imposing height and keyed the intercom, his voice cold and unyielding as tempered steel. This is Spymaster Xyloth. Councillor Zarkon has fallen. By right of succession, I am assuming command of the fleet. There was a momentary pause, pregnant with the weight of the words left unspoken. The crew looked to him, their expressions a mix of fear, uncertainty, and the first embers of a desperate, feral hope. Xyloth continued, each word a hammer blow. All ships break contact and prepare for emergency warp jump to Rally Point Omega. We will regroup and strike back at the humans tenfold. Let the galaxy burn before we yield. As if shaking off a deep slumber, the Draconis fleet began to ponderously turn, their drives flickering and stuttering as they strained against the damage wrought by the humans' relentless assault. One by one, the battered ships limped away from Earth's orbit, vanishing into the merciful embrace of warp space. Aboard the Moscow, Admiral Blackwell watched the Draconis rout on the viewscreen, his weathered face etched with grim satisfaction. The bridge crew erupted into cheers and applause, the tension of the last few hours finally finding release in a cathartic wave of emotion. Ambassador Adams stumbled to Blackwell's side, grinning fiercely despite the blood caking his face and the obvious pain of his injuries. He clapped the Admiral on the shoulder, his voice hoarse but triumphant. You crazy bastards actually did it. We won. Blackwell shook his head, a faraway look in his eyes as he watched the last of the alien ships wink out on the tactical display. 
No, Ambassador. This is just the beginning. The Draconis will be back, and the other council races will be right behind them. He turned to face Adams fully, his expression somber. We've bloodied their noses and bruised their egos, mark my words. They'll all come for us now. Humanity needs to be ready. With a decisive nod, Blackwell turned to his comms officer, the young woman straightening under his gaze. Get me fleet command and the president. It's time to take this war to the enemy. As the officer began relaying his orders, Blackwell turned back to the view screen, the blue-green curve of Earth filling the display. The planet looked peaceful from this distance, serene even, but he knew that today's battle was just the opening salvo in a much larger war. A war for the very survival of the human race. The council chamber on Thalia Prime hummed with a hundred different voices, a dozen alien tongues buzzing and chirping and hissing. Representatives from the galaxy's most powerful races perched in tiered rows of floating platforms that ringed the vaulted space. Insectoid Prelnax rubbed elbows with Reptilian Draconis, while Avian Zintak squawked and fluffed their iridescent feathers beside the bulbous-headed Quanar. At the central podium, Councillor Zinthax of the Prelnax hegemony wrapped his gavel, mandibles clicking in irritation. The murmuring died down as all eyes turned to the dais. Esteemed colleagues, Zinthax began, compound eyes glittering in the chamber's azure light, we convene today in a time of crisis. The upstart humans have not only repelled the Draconis' punitive fleet, but decimated it. A feat unprecedented in our millennia of supremacy. This cannot stand. The chamber erupted. Shouts of outrage and disbelief bounced off the curved walls. Appendages slammed on desks and wings beat the air in agitation. The Draconis ambassador, Casavor, surged to his feet. Scales flushed crimson with rage and humiliation. He pounded a clawed fist on his platform's control panel. The humans employed cowardly and dishonorable tactics, striking without warning. They must be made to pay for their insolence. Zinthax inclined his angular head. Indeed, the council races must unite to crush this threat before other client species get ideas of rebellion. He raised a segmented limb, Digits splayed wide to capture the chamber's attention. I propose a resolution, a full military mobilization, with each member race contributing ships and troops to a combined armada. Together we shall descend upon the human worlds like a swift and terrible blade, cutting out this cancer before it spreads. Kasvor hissed his approval, baring needle-sharp teeth. The Draconis Imperium commits a hundred warships to this righteous cause. Let the human worlds burn for their defiance. The Prilnax will match that number, Zinthax declared. Our soldier drones will darken the skies of Earth. One by one, the other councillors voiced their assent, each trying to outdo the last in ships and troops pledged. The Zintak boasted of their aerospace fighters that could shred human vessels like confetti. The Quanar spoke of armoured legions that would crush human cities beneath their heel. Are we in accord? Zinthax asked finally as the last pledge echoed through the chamber. A chorus of A's and raised appendages signified the Council's approval. The vote was unanimous. As the resolution passed, Zinthax felt a fierce grin stretch his mandibles. By this time next cycle, the human homeworld shall burn, and their vaunted heroes will be naught but ashes scattered on the solar winds. So let it be written. So let it be done. The councillors rose in a standing ovation, stomping and screeching and roaring, until the very foundations of the chamber shook with their bloodlust. Earth's fate was sealed. The massed might of the galaxy would fall upon it like an unstoppable storm, and the upstart humans would learn the folly of defying the Council's will. The skies over Earth churned with the chaos of battle. Uncountable ships swarmed like locusts blotting out the sun, a seething mass of alien metal here to erase humanity's cradle from the cosmos. The Terran fleet, exhausted, depleted, fought with desperate fury, mucking the Council Armada pay in blued for every inch of space. On the bridge of the Moscow, Admiral Cole Blackwell clenched his jaw as he watched the tactical display. His fleet was a guttering candle against the endless night of the invasion, 
for every enemy ship destroyed, two more surged forward, an inexorable tide. Ambassador Donovan Adams stood beside him, his once pristine suit now scorched and torn, stained with the grim residue of war. They'd fought this hopeless battle for months, the two of them, bleeding the Council forces in a fighting retreat back to the Soul System. Blackwell dragged a hand down his face. We can't hold them, Earth will fall, it's only a matter of time now. Adams nodded grimly. Then let's make sure those bastards choke on the ashes. If Earth burns, we'll light the damn fire ourselves and spit in their eyes as they watch. Proximity alerts blared, and Blackwell snapped his gaze back to the displays. A new contact, impossibly vast, a behemoth dwarfing even the Council dreadnoughts. Confusion sliced through the bridge crew. They had nothing that size. Had the Council been holding something back? But this ship was different, elegant and lethal, wrought in burnished silver metal, a raptor among vultures. And there, emblazoned on its armoured flanks, an emblem out of legend, the swooping wings and talons of the Terran Alliance, the star-spanning human civilization lost to myth and time. More ships poured out of warp space, a fleet of giants and a voice crackled over the comms deep and resonant, heavy with power and age. This is High Admiral Thorin Voss of the Terran Alliance. We received your distress call, our long-lost brethren. You fight with courage and honor against the tyranny we once faced. You do not fight alone. As one, the Terran ships opened fire. Lances of blinding energy slashed across space, tearing through the Council Armada's hulls like they were paper. Ships came apart, disintegrating, melting, consumed by stellar flame. The Moscow's bridge erupted into ragged cheers as the tide turned. But Blackwell and Adams didn't join the jubilation. They exchanged a heavy glance, the weight of history pressing down like gravity. They'd won this battle, yes, but the war churned on. The ghosts of the past had returned. Nothing would ever be the same. Unnoticed in the chaos, a single Terran shuttle slipped away from the carnage. It knifed down towards Earth, bearing a delegation from the Alliance, here to meet the leaders of the human resistance who had so valiantly defied the Council. Aboard the shuttle, a hooded figure stood at the viewport staring down at the blue-green jewel of Earth. A strange mix of pride and sorrow played across her face. It had been so long, but at last she had come home. The figure lowered her hood, revealing features both achingly familiar and rendered strange by the passage of eons. Admiral Amelia Blackwell, ancestor of the man even now fighting to save their species, breathed out a heavy sigh. It's time, she said softly, time to finish what we started all those years ago, time to forge a new future for humanity among the stars. The shuttle sliced through the atmosphere, the Terran fleet taking up positions in orbit, Around humanity's ancestral home, yes. But were they here as protectors, or harbingers of a new galactic order? Only time would tell, the battle was over. But the struggle for humanity's soul was just beginning. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.